This is the 2013 MEXT Special Training College Mathematics Paper. Let's begin. Question 1. We basically have to simplify this expression. Let's move this part to the denominator. And then square this part. Minus times minus is plus. 3 squared is 9. A squared b to the 4th power times 2 a squared b cubed 2 6 1 3 There should be nothing left on the denominator. The coefficient would be negative 3 and how many a's are there? 1 and how many b's? b squared So this is the answer. Question 2. Given this inequality, we need to find the range of x. So let's first assume that x minus 1 is a positive number, in which case we don't need to add the negative sign before it. And let's solve this inequality. So x must be smaller than 4. Let's assume that x minus 1 is a negative number, in which case we need to add the minus sign before it. This tells us that x must be greater than minus 2. So the range of x that satisfies this inequality is x is greater than minus 2 but smaller than 4. Question 3. So we are given that x squared minus 3x plus 1 is 0. Given this piece of information, we need to find the value of x plus 1 over x and x squared plus 1 over x squared. Let's make the denominators of these terms the same. Next, let's go back to the original quadratic equation and move the second term to the right hand side. So we know that x squared plus 1 is equal to 3x. So let's substitute 3x here. Now we know that x plus 1 over x is 3. And let's consider the second expression here. Again, by rearranging the terms of the original quadratic equation, we get x squared is equal to 3x minus 1. And let's substitute this value here. We got another term with x squared in it. And we arrived at an integer. And this integer, 7, is the final answer. Number 4. So we have cards with numbers printed on them, and the numbers range from 1 to 10, and we are taking 3 cards out of the 10. The first part says, what is the probability that the product of the numbers of the 3 cards is an odd number? Let's calculate the number of ways we can take 3 cards out of 10. This can be expressed as 10 choose 3, which is 10 factorial over 7 factorial times 3 factorial. 10 times 9 times 8 times 3 times 2 times 1. So there are 120 ways to take 3 cards out of 10 cards. In order for the product of 3 numbers to be an odd number, each of these three numbers must also be an odd number. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 odd numbers. So we are essentially choosing three numbers out of these five. So that would be 5 choose 3, which is 5 factorial over 2 factorial times 3 factorial. 5 times 4 over 2 times 1, which is 10. So the probability of the product being an odd number is 
ten over one twenty, which is one over twelve. Part two of question four says, "What is the probability that the sum of the numbers of the three cards is an even number?" So, in order for the sum of three numbers to be even, we have to do either even plus even plus even, or odd plus odd plus even. For example, two plus four plus six, or one plus three plus two. Let's consider the first case. Again, there are five even numbers between one and ten, so we are once again doing five choose three, which is ten. Let's consider the second case. There are also five odd numbers between one and ten. Five choose two. There are five. Even numbers between one and ten, so five choose one. And let's add these numbers together, and then divide it by one twenty. So the final answer is one over two. Question five. So we have a triangle ABC and three vectors with x, y, and z components. But vector AB is missing its x component, and vector BC is missing its y component, and vector CA is missing its z component. Given that ABC is a triangle, the sum of all the three x components must equal zero. Likewise, the sum of all the x components must equal zero. And so on. Therefore, x plus minus one plus three must be zero, because we are going from a, b, c, and back to a. So we know that x is minus two. Two plus y plus minus five must be zero. So y must be three. And finally, one plus four plus z. Must be zero, which means z must be minus five. Next, we need to find the scalar product of vector AB and vector AC. Vector AC is going in the opposite direction to vector CA, so vector AC must be minus three comma five comma five. And to get the scalar product of two vectors, we basically have to do this calculation: minus two times minus three plus two times five plus one times five, which is twenty-one. And this is the answer. Number six. So remember that the graph of log base two of x must look like this. Let us first simplify. We can take eight out of these two terms. Recall that log a times b, regardless of what the base is, can be rewritten as log a. Plus log b. Using this rule, we get log base two of eight plus log base two of x minus two. Log base two of eight is of course three because eight is two cubed. In general, the graph of log base two of x minus a plus b. Can be obtained by shifting the graph of this original function by a units along the x-axis and b units along the y-axis. Three units upwards plus two units to the right. Number seven. This is an arithmetic progression. In an arithmetic progression. 
The difference between one term and the next stays constant. That means 2 plus 3d equals minus 7. Therefore, the difference is minus 3. So, 2 minus 3 is minus 1, and minus 1 minus 3 is minus 4. And this time we have a geometric progression. In a geometric progression, we can get the second term by multiplying the first term by a certain ratio, r. And this ratio stays constant. Therefore, minus 6 times r squared is equal to minus 54. So r must be plus or minus 3. If r is plus 3, then the first term would be minus 6 divided by 3, which is minus 2. And minus 6 times 3 would be minus 18. And minus 18 times 3 is minus 54. And if r is minus 3, the first term would be minus 6 divided by minus 3, which is 2. The third term would be minus 6 times minus 3, which is 18. Number 8. When n equals 1, 1 over 1 times 2 is 1 half. When n equals 2, 1 half plus 2 times 3, which is 2 over 3. When n equals 3, 3 times 4. So I hope you see the pattern. 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4. So the denominator will always be n plus 1. 6 must be n and 7 must be n plus 1. Therefore, n must be 6. Question 9. So we are to find the value of f dash of minus 1. So let's expand the brackets first. And let's find f dash of x by differentiating f of x. Let's substitute x equals minus 1. Therefore, the answer must be minus 4. Section 2 Let's find a coordinate of the vertex of the parabola. The x-coordinate of the vertex can be found using this formula, where a is the coefficient of x squared and b is the coefficient of x. And let's substitute this value into the equation of the parabola. And these are the coordinates of the vertex. Next, if we assume that number 1, the parabola, and number 2, the straight line, have common points, what are the possible values of a? To visualize this question, let's draw a quick sketch. This is the parabola. In order for these two graphs to have one common point, the straight line must be tangent to the parabola, like this. And as the value of a increases, this straight line will move upwards, and then there will always be two points of intersection. So what this question is asking us to do is to find the value of a where the straight line becomes tangent to the parabola. And in order to find a tangent of a parabola, we have to differentiate the equation of the parabola. 2x plus 1 has to be equal to 3. And let's solve this equation here. And let's substitute this value into the equation of the parabola to find the y-coordinate of the point of tangency here. And finally, let's plug in these values into the equation of the straight line to find the value of a. So a is greater than or equal to minus 3. Question 2. In this question, we are told to assume that a equals 1, and we need to find the x-coordinate of the points of intersection of these two graphs. So let these two equations be equal to each other. 
and solve for x. The x coordinates of the points of intersection are minus 1 and 3. And next we need to find the area bounded by the two graphs here. What this means is that we need to solve the following. And let's expand these brackets first. So this is the area here. So now we are going to assume that there's a circle enclosed in the area here, and we are told that the equation of the circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is the radius, meaning that the center of the circle is 0, 0. So let's first of all figure out whether the center of the circle is closer to the straight line or the parabola. That is, we need to find the x-coordinates of these two points where the straight line and the parabola intersect the x-axis. Let's start with the parabola. We know that this point is to the right of the center of the circle, so we need to take this value here. And now let's substitute in the equation of the straight line. Since 0 is closer to minus 1 third than to positive 1, when the value of r, the radius, is at its maximum, this circle must be tangent to the straight line rather than the parabola. So let's find the coordinates of the point of tangency between the straight line and the circle. Since the slope of the straight line is positive 3, the slope of the normal that goes through the point of intersection between the straight line and the circle must be minus one third. When two straight lines are perpendicular to each other, the product of the slopes of the two straight lines must be equal to minus one. And because this straight line goes through the origin, the equation of this straight line must be minus one over three x. And now we can figure out the coordinates of the point of intersection here by solving this equation. So the x coordinate is minus 3 tenths and the y coordinate is positive 1 tenth. So now we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the value of r, the radius. The value of r is between 0 and root 10 over 10. Section 3, and this is the final section of this paper. This shouldn't be a problem. 3.6 is roughly 4. Root 10 is between root 9 and root 16, which are 3 and 4 respectively, so root 10 must be 3 point something. 7 minus 2 times 3 point something is going to be roughly 1. Sine 30 degrees is of course one half, cosine 45 degrees is root 2 over 2, tangent 60 degrees is root 3, root 2 is about 1.4, root 3 is about 1.7, this is roughly 6 over 2, which is 3, 3 raised to the power of 5 is 2, 4, 3, and 2 to the power of 5 is 32. We only need to see if the number in this digit is going to be greater than or less than 5. It's definitely going to be bigger than 5. This is roughly equal to 2. Twenty over three is roughly seven. And that's it. This is the end of this exam paper. See you next time.